Okay, cool. All right, all right. Hope everyone does not mind. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I know it's still kind of early and everything, so, uh, but let me uh, be the first to say welcome to uh, one of our first uh, seminars uh, presented uh, courtesy of Meek Productions. We're known as the world's first LGBT exclusive talent agency and production company. Um, we are in the process of celebrating our uh, 15th year. Oh and uh, this year, uh, we was very excited to uh, run into uh, an anointed brother at the home. And uh, he actually is one of our uh, you know, see, make sure you don't say it in front of the thing. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, he's actually one of our very first motivational, inspirational speakers, life coaches, and authors that's on our roster. And as a result of that, he's been deemed as our first gentleman of inspiration. Uh, you all are going to love him. Um, you're going to be inspired and empowered by him. Uh, one of the biggest testimonies I can give is that uh, the universe always knows who to bring into your life. Mm -hmm. And um, it's very important uh, for us to be aware of those signs that come. And uh, this is the second time within, I think, a 10 plus year period that I've heard the word redefine. And the first time that was introduced to me was actually right in the mid to late 90s, one of our late uh, pioneers here in the uh, ATL, uh, Reverend uh, S. Fabel Mahi. Um, she was the first one that kind of introduced me to the word redefine, and I have never heard of that. I said, well, how can you know, you know, how do you redefine? And because uh, the name of her ministry was called Redefine Faith Worship Center, and by her being an out trans person at the time, uh, she felt, she said, you know what, uh, because we've been so indoctrinated into, uh, into this system, not just as people of color, but also as the members of the LGBT community, we need to not allow other people to define who we are. So we have to redefine. Mm -hmm. ourselves, starting with our faith, starting with our beliefs, then redefining who we are as human beings, according to, you know, how the universe uh, deemed us for us to be our true self. So the word redefine came back again through Dr. Sanders, who I'm about to introduce now, and uh, uh, he's hailed from Columbus, Ohio, and he is a wonderful person, a beautiful spirit, very knowledgeable, and like I said before, very anointed. <laughs> this is his first time presenting at the uh, MSM Symposium, so please let me introduce none other than Dr. Jesse Sanders. I didn't know who he was talking about. <laughs> 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 a whole lot of good things. I need to write that down. <laughs> no, but I do thank you all again for your time and for joining me today, and I will give you just a little bit of history of who I am. I won't go into 30 minutes of who I am, but then 30 minutes into the session. But if you have any questions, you like, right. <laughs> but if you have any questions, uh, please, let's have open dialogue. I love open dialogue. I do not like lecture presentations. Um, so, and I love diversity as well. So, we all have different opinions, different belief systems, which is great. And that's what makes the world great, is our diversity. And as I tell my children, being unique, because there's only one of us. Um, God did not create a duplicate. There's only one of you. And so your uniqueness, your voice is needed uh, throughout the world. And so in this particular setting, throughout this presentation. But again, as he stated, my name is Jesse Sanders. I'm a single father with an 18-year-old daughter, Brianna, and she graduates this year, pray my strength. And then I have a nine-year-old daughter as well, Brielle, and I do shared parenting with her. I have been in the counseling and life coaching field since 2000. 12 graduated in February 2016 with my doctorate in family and marriage counseling. And what actually drew me into um, going further in my education and my knowledge, if you will, was the fact that there are a lot of dysfunctional families. Yeah. And there are a lot of single parents I could relate to, fathers I could relate to. And uh, when I work, um, as he stated, I'm from Columbus, Ohio, so I also work with an organization called CASA, which CASA is a special organization where advocates are appointed to certain family cases. 
uh, with Child and Family Protective Services. And so they may have us come in to evaluate um, the parents and or the parent um, and the child or children. And we give our evaluation. And it, it's sad because there are so many children who are in the legal system, if you will, simply because of dysfunctional families. Uh, parents don't know how to communicate, guardians don't know how to communicate, um, and you know a lot of times, you know, especially in our community, is why one person is talking and you are passionate about the subject, a lot of times we don't know how to completely listen because we're thinking of our rebuttal while they're talking and that's right. not proper communication. And so I am huge on integrity, on communication, and my 18 year old always laughs at me, Bruce, she always laughs because uh, when we have talks, even in our family, I practice what I preach. So we have open dialogue, respectful dialogue, of course, because they're children. Uh, but communication is open, and I believe that it's so important to be able to communicate. But then the side piece that I found out is a lot of people don't know how to communicate because a lot of people are not in tune with their true identity or comfortable with who they are. And so when you are not healed, when you are bruised internally, it affects how you communicate. It affects how you engage with people. Um, it's difficult to have interpersonal, uh, healthy interpersonal relationships because you're not healed within. And healing is very important. And last night I was on Facebook Live. Hello, Facebook. Yeah, you look you. beautiful as always. Thank I'm good. You. Thank you. And so last night I was on my on the Facebook Live and I was telling them on the live that you know I had a client uh, last week, her and her partner are getting a divorce, and she was going in and telling me um, how she's healed and you know how she's over it. And Dr. Jesse, I'm fine, I'm over her, and etc. And I'm just listening to her and looking at all this neck twisting. And so that that's my first sign that you're not over it because right. of all this attitude you're giving me. So I'm just sitting there listening because I'm big and I had asthma as a kid, so I saved my oxygen. And so I'm just sitting there, I'm just sitting there, let her talk. And she ran into um, her estranged wife at the grocery store. And I asked her, well, how did that, how did that encounter go? And she said, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't deal with it. I walked around. I said, well, did you have to walk around or did you need something in the aisle she was in? I needed something, but I just walked around. I said, this is why I just let you do all that talking and all that Shaniqua acting in the last session because I knew you were not free because avoidance is not deliverance. If you're able to walk past them and say, hello, how are you? You don't have to hold a conversation. I don't care about your light bill. I don't care about your groceries. Just how are you doing? And I'm able to smile genuinely because nothing <laughs> pops up on the inside of me. That lets me know I'm free. And so she asked me, she said, so are you really free from everyone that did you wrong? I said, absolutely. Because I learned it took too much energy out of me. And because I had so much negativity in me, that's what I was drawn to me. Because what we are is what gravitates to us, right? So what I am is what's going to gravitate back to me. And so I began to heal from every ex that I still was mad at, didn't want to talk to them, didn't accept their friend request on Facebook. And I said, okay, Jesse, food, something is still wrong with you. And so I had to begin to go through my process. And the process is difficult, but I had to do two things. One, accept my process, and two, respect my process. Because when you respect, the, when you respect something or someone, you will yield to it. So I had to yield to my process, that Jesse, you have to go through this process. And so there's not one ex that I have, whatever they've done, whatever I've done, that I see them or wish any ill will towards them, because I'm free, I'm healed. And then I also had to evaluate my inner circle, because a lot of times we call people friends that are not friends, That's and right. I do not use that word loose. But when I hear everybody walking around talking about, hey, this is my sister, this is my brother, like, how, many, how many is it? How many of them is it? Because you're just connecting to too many people and drawing those spirits to you. So while you're trying to change, you're adding additional outside baggage unto you. So it becomes a process that is not effective for you at all. So when I was sitting at home and the word redefined just came to me, not a word I really thought about 
uh, to be honest. And the word redefine came to me, and I'm a definition person, so I don't know what does it mean, where did it originate from, you know, I'm one of those people. And so that I, you know, redefine basically means to reevaluate, means to reexamine. And not just everyone around you, but me. I have to look myself in the mirror. And I tell my clients all the time, it is important to do the self-confrontation process to where you confront yourself with what is in me so that while I'm walking into my truth and the truth that I'm healing and that I'm drawing good things to me so that good things can come to my children and my children's children because that's how the effect happens. And so when you have a dysfunctional family, a lot of times the lineages in that family, they have those same similar dysfunctions. And I believe that we can reverse it one family at a time by starting with us. That the hurts that I went through, and I tell my daughters all the time, I can't stop them from some things they're going to endure in life, right? Because life is life. But I can help them with my truth that I wasn't always the victim in things. There were sometimes we were the villains, mm -hmm. whether it was a payback or whatever. And I know everybody's not going to admit that, so some of y'all more saved than me. And so you know, sometimes we were the villains. And I'm open with my children that, you know, this is a mistake I made, and this is what I learned from that mistake. And one thing I thank God for, of course, my children are children, but even with my 18-year-old, I see her walking in her own truth. She doesn't allow her friends to dictate, dictate you know, which direction she's going to go. And she told one of her friends, she said, one thing I love is that my dad is open, uh, respectfully with me. But it's because we have to destroy, not just break, but destroy those negative cycles so that we can walk into our wealthy self. So, I want to start off with that. So today we're basically going to be talking about the whole me is the powerful me. Um, and you can look at the information if you want, because I am not one of those that go by everything. Can you see it? You cannot. Okay. What are the dim lights? And I was going to, that's a good idea. And I'm going to try to put it in presentation mode. Okay. That's good. That's not something about life. So every day we're evolving. But what I call the, the major red zone items are the things that I know gets to me that I need to work on. I call those the red zone items. So like, for example, we were talking earlier about driving, road rage. I'm horrible at it. I know I'm horrible at it. I know I need free from it. And I tell the Lord, just work with me the best that you can. I could be in the passenger seat of your car and trying to tell you how to drive, getting on your nerves. And so that's something that I know I need. I really need to work on because it gets on some people's nerves. And so I'm like, okay, Jesse, this is something you need to work on. So we all have some, you know, small things that we need to work on, but what are the big things, the, the red zone area things? What are the big things I need to work on? And I tell people, you cannot just start with where you are now. You have to go back to your childhood because one thing I let people know is that we live what we learn so what we learn as children we live and even if we got free and free throughout time sometimes there could be some residue that is still there and I need to get rid of the residue that's there and so I tell people don't start where you are now because that makes it easy for you start back 
as a child, some of your behaviors, your upbringing, who raised you, what was their characteristics like, who did they say you act like when you were a child, who you act just like auntie so-and-so, and she was meaner than a bird, and you did, and so are you that mean, and why are you that mean, what brought you to that place to make you angry, and so I tell people it's always imperative to start from the beginning, because again, we all live what we learn, every one of us. That is something you cannot get by psychologically, scientifically. We live what we learn. It is just that simple. And so there are some things that I need to, may need to look at. You know, one example, which to me is a good example, you know, I was raised by my grandparents from middle school on up. So every time I discipline my children, I find myself saying something that my grandmother or grandfather said to me. Even if I was not consciously thinking about it, it just came out because they raised me. And so when I'm disciplining my children, I'll say something to them, and at the end I'll think, oh my gosh, I can hear Quentin Sanders telling me that in high school. And so because that's the environment that I was in. So we have to start from the beginning and evaluate everything. Now that wilderness process is an ugly process, but it's a necessary process. Because I'm not going to be able to, one, have a self-relationship, which is a relationship with myself, and two, I'm not going to be able to have an interpersonal relationship. Interpersonal relationship meaning with someone else. I'm not going to be able to um, co-communicate with someone else. I'm not going to have a healthy relationship with someone else if I do not begin to work from the beginning. It's just like a book. You cannot start in the middle of a book and get everything you need. You have to start from the beginning, not know if you're like me, like there's some series, some shows I started watching, and I may have caught like the sixth episode, and then I wanna, I'm like, okay, I got to see what happened in one through five. So it brought me to episode six, I have to see that. And a lot of times, we do that. We like to skip chapters because it works better for us. And those are the people I normally know don't wanna confront themselves. Because I would prefer to start at chapter 6 than for you to take me back to chapter 1 or take me to chapter 2 when I was in my first abusive relationship, whether physically or verbally. Abuse is abuse, right? And so I'd rather not go back there. I don't want to relive that. And I'm not asking you to relive it. I'm asking you to re-examine it from the place you are now. Because a lot of times when we're in it, we don't see it the same way we, when we come out of it. So where I am now, my vision now, was not my same vision then, right? Like, you know, a lot of us, when we get older, our vision changes, yeah. and so now we need, some of us need reading glasses and et cetera. We didn't need them 10 years ago, but now it's like, I need to look, my head is hurting, I need my reading glasses. As we grow, our vision changes. So now I can go back from this perspective, from this healthier place that I'm in, for this more mature place I'm in, to see what did I need to gain from that. Because when I'm in it, I don't see what I need to gain from it. A large percentage of us do not. Because we just see the anger, we see the hurt, we see the backbiting, we don't see the lessons. But when I'm out of it and I'm free from it, I can now see the lessons that I had to gain from it because, and we've heard this before, we have learned something from everyone that we have been connected to, whether in a positive manner or negative manner, but it was a lesson that's going to help you live your best life right now. It is a lesson that's going to help you live your best life. So we're on truth and numbers, but I'm a truth and number person, and so, uh, there's approximately 44.7 million people, which is about 18.3 people in the U.S. who has who suffer with mental illness. Now, one thing I always say, um, and three times, of course, are more likely to be individuals in the LGBT community because these are people that deal with identity, um, you know, coming out, and we know the minority community can be one of the worst communities to come out to. It's like they will hang you, uh, you know, for who you are. Um, one thing I tell people is the numbers are increasing of people that have mental illnesses. 
Now, the funny thing about that is the numbers are increasing. However, the number of people getting help is increasing as well. So, does that sound funny to you too, not just to me? Sounds a little strange, if you will, that if more people are getting help, why are the numbers still rising? The numbers should be decreasing. They should be declining. There should not be an incline in numbers when more people are getting help. And if, one time I was at lunch myself and some other therapists and doctors, and we were talking. And, you know, a lot of times when you... Um, have your state license, you have guidelines that you have to go through by the state. Certain things you can say, certain things you can't say, some things you can do, and etc. And so a lot of times the state just wants to medicate people with mental illness. You need this medication, which really just makes turns you into a zombie. It does not deal with the illness itself. It doesn't help the healing process. It doesn't help you mentally. It just helps you become a zombie through the process. So your feelings, it's, it's tricking your mind. It's basically what it does. Same thing as pain, you know, medication. When we take pain medications, the pain is still there. The pain medication just sending a signal to the neurons in your brain to tell your brain you don't have any pain. So it lasts for so long and then you feel the pain, you know, a few hours later. That's all the medication does. And with the number of people getting help, but yet more counselors are just putting people on medication. Now I tell people, even my clients, and when I travel and speak, I'm not against medication. That's what they feel they need and their doctor feel they need their agreement. Okay, I like to deal with the heart. I want to deal with the matter. There's a lot of clients I don't even accept because I know they will probably want to fight me. Um, you know, in the session, and I will fight them back. That's why I don't be fooled. So, and no, I, you'll never hear me preach turn the other cheek. The devil is a liar. And so, and so um, I take people on who really wants to make a change and who really wants to partner and say, you know what? This is destroying me. I need to come out of this. This is not healthy. It's not healthy for me. It's not healthy for my children. It's not healthy for my co-workers to have to deal with my attitude because I come into work ticked off every morning. And the only way that we're going to see a decrease, a decline in these numbers is if we deal with the heart. Me dealing with myself. Me dealing with my real issues. Not what someone did to me, but what is my issue. When we can hold a conversation with ourselves and say, Jesse, what is your problem? Not who did it. Not where I was molested when I was 12. And, okay, you were molested. That's valid. What feeling did you get from that molestation? Okay, you were with someone you thought you were in love with. They, they were unfaithful to you. They were not good communicators. Okay, you've named all their problems. What feeling did you get from that, from them being unfaithful, from them not being able to communicate? Because it's once we heal the feeling that we get progress. Not who did it and why they did it, who shot John and who went over the cat. It's what is the feeling, how can I get through this process of the feeling so that I may progress and move on. That is the only way we're going to see a decline in the numbers. And even in regards to the LGBT community, every time I see, especially, you know, young men who are in and out of relationships, and you know, there a lot of young men are just searching for that father figure, that authority figure. So they're in and out. So when it doesn't work with this one, they go to the next one, they go to the next one. And you know, sadly, that's why there's an incline even in the number of HIV and AIDS because not only are they dealing with their own inner uh, mental issue, but now they're taking on someone who is unhealthy for them. So now they are just kind of do making a dual problem within their life. All because I just want an authority figure. I, I really want a father. And so unit works, so I'm going to move on to the next one. It even amazes me the websites that you see, you know, with the um, uh, uh, older men who are advertising, you know, to take care of younger men. The sugar daddy, 
sites that are out there. I didn't even know that until about three weeks ago when I had a client. I thought, sugar daddy sites, who advertises that? And it amazed me. You know, I went on and I looked and I said, there are all these sugar daddy sites. I just Googled it. Like, oh my gosh, there is a lot of these sites. Because some of these older men are knowing the issues that some of these younger men are having. And so they are saying, I can meet your external need. But the younger men, of course, are not thinking about the internal needs. They're saying, I can give you this money. I can do that. I can do this. And so even my goal, there's an organization in Columbus, sidebar real quick, a men's organization. And they now have started um, a segment to help younger men because they see the incline of numbers of younger men that is getting affected with HIV and AIDS. And so they talked to, they reached out to some of us therapists to say, how can we connect to help these numbers decrease, to help these people? Because what we have to realize is that every physical illness we know starts with an emotional illness. Mm -hmm. It does not start physically. It started emotionally. So just think if we can deal with the emotional side just think of the decrease of number of unhealed people we would have. And then we all can go and birth something out of someone else to help someone else get healed. Because, and you know, the word says the blind cannot leave the blind or they both will fall into a ditch. And so I can't be blind and you be blind. I'm talking about let's turn left. Boo, how do you know we need to turn left? Neither one of us can see. And so we need to have someone that has come out, has clear vision, and can say, I can recognize what's in you because it was once in me, and you can come out of it too. We have to be able to do that. We have to be able to be transparent with where I was, where I am, and where I desire to be because then that's only the time we're going to be able to help, especially the LGBT community. We need that healing in our community because what we have to realize is that the healing is going to come from within, not from the outsiders. The healing from the LGBTQ community is going to come from within. And what if they meet someone who's authentic and they say, wow, Craig, you are the most authentic LGBT, if you are LGBT, you're the most authentic LGBT person I've seen and you're not trying to sleep with me but you really care about my heart. You really care about me as an individual. And just think of the freedom that would take place, that liberation within them. And then they go talk to their friends. Do you see the trickle reaction I'm talking about here? And then they go talk to their friends and say, you know, that's what we used to do, but I'm not into that no more. I talked to Craig and I, you know, went through this healing process and it becomes a trickle reaction. But someone has to have vision. Someone has to be able to see. And you cannot have clear vision if you still have residue and hurt in you. Does anybody, does anybody have any comments or questions? You cannot have clear vision. And I tell people that. And again, every morning when I get, um, get up after I meditate and I get in the shower and I tell the Lord, you know, if there's something I need to see, reveal it to me about me. If there's something I need to see, speak, speak to me. I'm open. I'm receptive to what it is that you want to say. Because I want to be the best me that I can be for myself, for my children, for my future partner. I want to be the best me that I can be. And I can only be that if I'm constantly examining myself. That's healthy. Okay? We kind of already discussed this, but we'll go over it. So the mind, body, and the soul. Talk about how we're all connected. And our body responds to the way that we feel, think, or that we act. So we talked about, again, those physical illnesses. My body responds to how I feel, what my emotion is, and even to how I act. What, what are my actions as a result to the emotion? that is within me, and it affects our body. So if I can have a healthy mind and a healthy soul, I can have a healthy body. I can be whole. I can be perfect. And not perfect in the sense to where I don't make mistakes, but another definition of perfect means to be complete. 
I can be complete. That's why well, even when I teach single seminars, I tell the other singles that it's not what we're both just bringing to the table. But are they complete and are you complete? If not, there's going to be some issues that you're going to endure in the beginning. So we just need to lay it all out on the table. Are you, are you complete? Are there some things that you're dealing with that I need to know about? Because, you know, sometimes people just look at other people and be like, ooh, that's my husband. Fool, you better look beyond those muscles. That fool got a problem. You better look, you better look beyond the outer physique. And I have friends like that. I look at people like, ooh, he's fine. I'm gonna get his number. All right, you gonna get more than you gonna get his phone number, his prison block number that he had, his medication list numbers. You better think beyond that. And there's and so that tells me even the mindset of where most of our people are. Because how do you look at someone from the outside? Now we know there are people that look nice and etc. But how do you know that that's who you want to be with just from one look? Because they look nice. You have to look beyond that. And one thing I've noticed is that when we're healed, we can see when someone else is not. Yes. So I yes. can see. So yes. whatever spirit I have, so if I had a whore spirit and now I'm free, I'm no longer a whore, I can look at someone else that has that spirit because we were able to relate to it. So when you possess something, you're able to relate to it. You're able to see it because you possess it. That, that's one part of discernment. One thing we have to work on is our stress, our, our anxiety, being upset. One of the words in my house is peace in the valley. When my kids are just doing too much, I tell them peace in the valley. Now I'm going to stop punching folks in the face. Peace in the, peace in the valley. And so my nine-year-old, my little secretary, she sometimes when things are going on, she'll say peace in the valley. I feel like breathe. You part of this problem. How do you talk about peace in the valley? And she a peace in the valley. And so that's that's because I believe our home is our sanctuary. Yes. Yes. The world is chaotic enough. There is enough going on outside of my front door. When I come to my place of residence, I should not have to sit in the driveway for 20 minutes. Yeah. Who is going to feel like going? What is going to be in here? Jesus, I'm trying to stay safe today. What is going to be in here that's going to make me go off? When you have that feeling, it needs to be a home evaluation. Yeah. And everybody in the house, we all, everybody needs to talk. The cat, the dog, the bird, the dishes, everybody. We need a conversation. Because that is my sanctuary. So that's my place of peace. And we have to remember that the enemy always starts with the place where I'm conformed to the most. And so if I'm in my home, I should have peace in my bathroom, in my kitchen, in my bedroom, on the back patio, even in the garage. There should be peace Absolutely. in the place where I reside That's and where I, where I lay my head, right? Because when, you when you're in a place of peace, you can know better. There are people I know that have had nightmares in their homes like I just I keep having these nightmares and so we'll talk about things that they can implement in their home to make their environment more conducive for peace to rest in there mm -hmm. and they do this when they make those changes and not allow everybody into their house so that's one of my rules I just don't invite anybody mm -hmm. over into my house because people leave spirits as well and so I noticed that when, that when they start to implement those changes then they say, Dr. Jeffrey, I've had a nightmare in like three weeks. It feels good to sit in my living room. Mm -hmm. There are some clients I know, when they go home, they say they go straight up to their bedroom, watch TV from their bed, everything is from the bed. And they, I haven't sat in my living room for about a month or two months just because of what I felt. So I would just shut myself in my room. Shutting, isolating yourself is not the answer. <laughs> But reevaluating yourself and your atmosphere, mm -hmm. that is the answer. Mm -hmm. Me looking at what needs to be done. And there's a lot of people who say, okay, well, that's easy if you have examples, you know, around you, friends, family. But what if you're it? It starts with you. You're, you are the trailblazer. 
So some people say, what is it? And I tell them it's going to be hard as hell. It's going to be difficult because you don't have a previous blueprint to go to to see how to start it. You're in. You're the trailblazer. You're the one that's starting this new thing for your family. Again, for your children. If you have nieces or nephews, if you don't have children, who's ever connected to you. So you're the trailblazer. It's going to be hard as hell, but it's doable. It's possible. And I'm not going to keep telling myself that it's going to be hard because the more I tell myself it's going to be difficult, the weaker I get because I'm yielding to it every time. Every time, oh, guys, i got to do this again today. This is going to be difficult. I'm making my muscles weaker. I'm making my emotional muscles weaker. I need to start speaking a new language. I need to start saying something new. And, you know, I don't want to just get all scripture on y'all, you know, but, you know, you have to begin to speak something new. Speak those things that be not as though they were. This is my reality is, is that this is where I am. But this is where I desire to be. So I'm about to speak it until I see that thing come to pass. I'm about to speak it while I'm in the middle. Not when I get out of it. Mm -hmm. A lot of us want to talk when we get out of it because now we bad. Mm -hmm. Oh, I done made it out of this. I'm a bad man pajama. You was just a punk when you was in it two days ago. Oh, now you a bad man pajama. Girl, you don't want to sit down somewhere. Look, you need to in the middle of it is where... I need to begin to speak those words. There are two things that I will learn while I'm in the middle. That is one, separation, and two, revelation. Those are two things I'll get while I'm in the middle of the fire, not when I get out of it. See, there's some knowledge and wisdom you can't get when you come out of it. There's some things that you get when you in it. Just like some, if someone came to you and told you about, you know, how they had a partner who was abusive to them and you've never been abused, you'll never really understand. You can have sympathy for them, but you cannot have empathy for them. Yeah. I can't relate to where you've been. I can hear you. My heart can go out to you. But if I've been in it, I can have sympathy and empathy. I can relate, but I've been there. I had to punch him in the face too, so I understand. I, I've been there. We can have empathy. And so the two things while I'm in the middle is when I need to gain my strength. Because again, the two components I'm going to get is separation and revelation. What is my separation? It is me being free from some things and some people. Because things and people show their authentic self while you're in the fire. Yes. So when you're in the middle, that's when you see if best friend is really best friend. Whoa, whoa, whoa. That's when you see if you know your prayer partner is really a prayer partner or she can't pray her way out of a White Castle bag. That's when you begin to see those things while you're in the middle of the thing. And then I get revelation. There's wisdom and insight that I get while I'm in the middle that I cannot get when I come out of it because I have to be in it and experience to gain this wisdom. Have you ever heard somebody talk and tell their story and you were just you were just involved? You were involved in this story. You're like, oh my God, she has a testimony. He has a testimony. And then there's some people you can tell, tell a story just for entertainment purposes, lying, started off lying, gonna end up lying. And she'd be like, ooh, they don't shut up. I'm hungry now. They don't shut up. But then there are some people you can tell have gained some wisdom. And so you sit like an empty cup and just let them pour into you. Because you can see they've been through something. And they made it out. Whether they were crying, crawling, or hollering, they made it out. And they understood the essence of the separation and the revelation. While I'm in the middle. Somebody just say in the middle. In the middle. That's good. Man. I tell people, thank, thank you. But when you've been through some things, you know, huh? <laughs> look, look, I'm sure we all can make each other's heads spin. <laughs> like, what? You look out there and you done been through that? Oh, I know some people who look rough. You're not in jail. <laughs> look, I done had that break my way through it quite a few times on that. <laughs> so, I even tell people, you know, they have high blood pressure 
or you know stomach ulcers, pain in their um, uh, ab abdomen area. And I said, I was having these problems on this. And one thing that their doctor will always ask them is, but what's taking place in your life? What's going on? Because they, they want to see what is the cause of this. You know, is it more stressful on your job? You know, did you lose a job? Is it more stressful at home? Because not only are they going to give you the medication to help you get through it, but they're also kind of going to give you a little bit of wisdom and say, you know, you can just take your time. You know, stop moving so quickly. You know, there was um, two summers ago, I had high blood pressure for like a month, and I never had high blood pressure. I'm like, oh, this is the devil. No. And so my doctor asked me, you know, what's going on in your life? Well, the same thing that's been going on. I work, I have my children, I'm involved in activities. So nothing really had changed in my life. And then he said something, and it kind of hurt me a minute. He said, well, just as you know, you are getting older. The 39-year-old Jesse is not the 29-year-old Jesse. So what you were able to carry and do then when you were a little bit younger, the body doesn't respond the same. And I remember my grandmother told me that. And I thought, what? And I'm looking at her like, yeah, you're not, you look good, you moving around, I'm going to be all right. Then when he told me that, I thought, oh, Lord. So he asked me to evaluate my life. And so I did. I just kind of played back in my mind. You know, what's, what's going on? I found myself going to the grocery store, rushing through aisles on days I had nothing to do. But because it was such a pattern for me that I'm busy. So a lot of times when I go to the store, look, my list is on my phone, so I know what I'm going to get, so I don't forget anything. I'm getting out to either go to work, go to a meeting, get ready to hit the road, do something with the girls. And days that I had none of that to do, I was still flying through the aisles. For what, fool? You ain't got nowhere to go after this. But it was a pattern. And so my doctor said, Dr. Alcoon said, Jesse, just be conscious of the days you really have nothing to do but go home and just take your time and stroll down the aisles. Get what you need and walk like normal people. You don't have to act like you're in a race. And I started doing that. Like two weeks, my blood pressure went down because I became conscious of I don't have to keep this pattern going. I need to balance. And so two weeks, he took me off the blood pressure medication he had me on. He said, you're back to normal. Thank God it's been that way. But I became more conscious that, Jesse, you don't have to fly through the store today. You don't have to do, you don't have to fly down the road. Because, you know, yeah, I told you about my road rage. So I'm just used to oh, even no. driving fast. So I'm like, get to my destination. You're going to the mall. You ain't got no time if you got to be at the mall, fool. Take your time. <laughs> That's how I talk to myself. I don't know how you talk to yourself. And so I had to be conscious of that. Now I need to balance because I'm taking me out of here. And out of here, I mean six feet out of here. I'm taking me out of here. So I need to be conscious of my life and that if I'm not healthy, no one around me can gain healthy benefits from me because I'm not healthy. So what benefit am I going to be to you weak, depressed, high blood pressure, pain in my stomach? No benefit for my children, my nieces, my nephews, all because I'm not healthy. So you cannot gain a healthy benefit. Um, emotional health which we talked about, which is number five. And so I'm not going to go through, you know, every one of them. Um, but emotional health. Where am I at emotionally? I always tell people, do not be in a place of delusion. Because there's a lot of people that are in a place of delusion. And you, they will begin to sit down. I've seen people sit down a lot of therapists. Like, what's going on in your life? They done made up this whole story. They done made up folks in the story there. They don't even know. And it's like I cannot walk around emotionally healthy if I don't deal with my reality. 
Again, I can speak those things that be not as though they were. That's the power within me. I have that power. We have that power. But I also have to deal with reality because in order for me to operate in that power, I need to deal with how I'm going to come out of where I currently am. And a lot of people don't want to do that. Oh, the Lord going to do it. No. He gave you the power to do it. When I hear people make those excuses all the time, oh, I'm just waiting on the Lord to heal me. What did you waiting on him to do exactly? I'm confused. What, what are we waiting on? That's, that's what I want to know. Because everything he needed to do, he completed on the cross. Mm -hmm. So I need you to operate. When he left here, he told his disciples, greater works will you do. So everything that he did, he said, now I'm going to leave this power with you so that you can begin to operate in right, Christ. Right. One thing I tell my clients, which I love, so one of my clients like, you need to incorporate that when you travel. And I said, oh, I might do that. Because one thing I tell them is it's important to confront, to conquer, and to celebrate. So you can just say it with me. Confront, confront conquer, conquer, and celebrate. And celebrate. What does it mean to confront? It means to face a challenge head on. It means to encounter. So when I'm confronting, and we're talking about ourselves right now, nobody else. So when I am confronting myself, I'm becoming face to face with me. I am having a personal encounter with myself. Confronting allows me to deal with my good, bad, and my ugly. It allows me to deal with all of I know we show each other the good side of us. But there's a good, bad, and an ugly in everybody. And so it allows me to, it allows me to confront myself that, Jesse, this is what you need to work on. You're not going to have healthy friendships. You're not going to have a healthy intimate relationship with the partner. If you don't begin to work on these things, no one in their right mind is going to want to deal with you. That, that is me confronting myself. Then I have to conquer. After I confront, I have, then I can conquer. And to conquer means to overcome by force. Um, first of all, I, I want to ask, is anyone offended with me using scripture references? I just want to ask. Okay. I, I, like, I like to respect everybody's belief system. Um, I need to conquer. I tell people, um, if you've read Matthew chapter 11, verse 12. Yeah, Matthew 11, 12. You know, the scripture says, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God suffered violence. And what happened? Uh -huh better talk like some soldiers. The, the violence, take it by force. And when I hear people preach and teach that scripture and they just get excited and folks is hooping and hollering and, and I tell them, do you even know no, what the exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Like, do you even know what that means? No. And, you know, I tell people, we know uh, in, um, uh, in that time the Gentiles were considered the unclean people, the Jews were considered God chosen people. But when the Gentiles found out that they had the same access that the Jews had, the scripture said that they took it by force. They didn't ask the Jews, can we work together on this? Now y'all had this a long time. Now y'all y'all done brought out my hood side. So now I got to take this by force because there's some things. I could have been getting from the Father that I wasn't getting because I thought I was less than. But now that I have, notice earlier I said in the middle we gained revelation, we gained wisdom. Now that I understand the power that is within me, I'm going to take this thing by force. And a lot of us, we get meek and we get quiet. And there's a time and a place for all that. And then there's a time and a place to say, I know that none of y'all want me free, but I'm about to get free. So is. move move out of my way. There I ain't is. wearing a church hat to do it, and I don't got no church fan. I'm coming through, and I'm coming through violently to conquer this place that I'm in. Because reality is, is that we all have a story. Mm -hmm. And your story is not my story, and my story is not your story. And when you find
find out that you have a way of escape, don't start me up in here. When you find out you have a way of escape, you like, oh, I've been too nice to y'all help us. I'm coming through like a bulldozer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming through like a bulldozer. On, and now. if anybody's in the way, including your little fluffy cat, she getting ran over. Because I'm coming through to cut out. Just think about it. When you have been in something and you've been in this dark place, mm, and now all of a yeah. sudden I find Speak out that there's a door right in front of me, a way of escape. <laughs> I ain't the one. I am not the one. I'm coming through like a bulldozer. And that's what it is to conquer. For me to conquer the definition, for me to conquer, to overcome by force, to overcome by mental, if y'all catch that, mental or moral power. So I'm not just coming through physically. Right. My body is out. But mentally, I am conquering this thing. I'm defeating this thing. Mm, this good. thing is no longer going to take over me. And there's a lot of people who are coming out with their bodies, but their mind is still in the wilderness. Mm. No. Conquer means I need to come out mentally and physically. Right. That my mind came with me. I didn't ask nobody, can you just hold my mind real quick back here and I'm going to come back and get it tomorrow. No, I'm coming out mentally and morally. Everything connected to me is coming out. Yeah, are are y'all with me? Yeah. What does it mean to be, uh, be healthy? Healthy is a condition of being of sound in mind, body, and spirit. Mm -hmm. So if you are out of sync, in your mind, body, or your spirit, you are not healthy. Now, I know some of y'all not going to like that. There's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> I can't, can't make up nothing about it. That's why it's important to examine those things. You know, it's funny. Um, at, at my church, they started implementing um, a workout ministry. Uh, I think they said like four people showed up at the workout ministry, when we knew about 80 of them needed it. And it was like, nobody, nobody wants to take the time to get them, their whole selves, you know, together. And I'm not, you know, I'm like Monique now. I'm not saying being four figure is unhealthy, because there's a lot of four figure people who are healthy. They're, they're good. But then there are some people who are not, but, those are the folks that's waiting on the Lord to come and make himself into an exercise machine. <laughs> to be whole, it means to recover physically, mentally, and emotionally in a sound manner. So if I'm whole, I'm recovering everything that I lost in the battle. So everything that I lost in the battle, I'm going to recover it. And I'm going to become physically, mentally, and emotionally sound. In order to be powerful, I have to be significant. Meaning, having meaning. There is something to me. And that's why I said earlier when I tell single people that you don't need to get with nobody to make you who you need to be. I came as my own individual, right, and right. this is what I possess. When you get me, you get something great. That's See, anybody, are there any single people here besides, besides me? Look, when I become a uh, whole, when you get me, I let them know, oh, you got something. And they look like, oh, think he, no, I'm not being conceited. I just want you to know what you got. Mm -hmm. And when I look at you as my partner, I want to know I got something. So when folks compliment him, I can say, yeah, he's mine. That's mine right there. That's mine right there. That's good because when you're whole, you can be sound. Oh, you cannot so make sound decisions Come on. if you're not healed. Are y'all are with me? Oh, yes. It means to be potent. Achieving or bringing results, being effective. How are you powerful? And you are not bringing no results and you're not achieving anything. 
if I ask you next week, what did you conquer? You should be able to tell me something because again, every day we're evolving. Absolutely. If you ask me next week, Jesse, what did you conquer? I should be able to name something I overcame mm -hmm. from the previous week. Because that's the only way I'm powerful, that's the only way I'm operating in power, is by bringing forth some results, being effective. Right, absolutely. How am I being effective just sitting there like a statue? The next one, celebrate. Celebrate is to honor and to hold up. Normally, what I tell people, and I had to learn this for myself, is a lot of times we celebrate everybody else. Boy, boy, boy. <laughs> and then you look for you, and you somewhere down there. You somewhere down there. But you have celebrated everybody else. You've sown into everybody else. But when it comes for you, it's like, oh, I can wait. I tell people, celebrate every hurdle you jumped over. Every hurdle. I don't care if it's small to you. Celebrate it. I came over that. All right, what am I going to do for myself this week? Celebrate you. Make it a habit. Make it a habit to celebrate you like you celebrated everybody That's else. Right there. That's it. Make it a habit. Because we made that a habit. Right. Am, am right. I right, Pastor right. T? Right. We made that a habit. Celebrate everybody else. Get a partner. We shower on more gifts. Giving them this, giving them that. And when it comes to you, it's, oh, I'll be all right. No, I won't be. Celebrate me. I'm going to celebrate me. And what's going to happen is, is that when people connect with me, they're going to, again, understand that I'm whole and that I'm healthy and that I'm powerful. And they're going to say, oh, I'm someone who's been through something and I'm great and I deserve to be celebrated. We have to make that a habit. Yes, you got to say something yeah, else. A lot of times we wait for, once we've celebrated everybody else, we wait for them to yeah, celebrate right. us. Yeah. And then when it doesn't happen, we become very disappointed. And then we tend to feel, and I'm talking about me, we tend to feel me disappointed, <laughs> you know, or not worthy of yes. being celebrated. So if I change that and celebrate myself, it doesn't matter whether you do it or not, then I'm, I'm good. I'm going to be good because I know that I'm worth it. Exactly. You about to say something? Yeah. yeah. No, I'm just giving. No, I thought you were going to say something. Yeah, it's, it, I'm telling you, it's important. We make it a habit. So when I begin to celebrate me, I made it a habit. And so I need to understand I'm worthy. I'm worthy to be celebrated. I remember one time I was preaching at a conference, and one of my spiritual sisters, you know, the conference was heavy. There was over 200 people at the altar. My team and I was working it. I was drained, sweat. I'm back in the office. She comes back in the office to pray over me. While she praying over me, I'm speaking in tongues. While she praying over me, she literally stopped in the middle of the prayer and said, will you shut up? Mm -hmm. I'm like, you just me for no reason. And she was like, I'm trying to pour into you and give you something. And you're so used to giving out, you're trying to pray with me. She's like, mm -hmm. I know that. I don't need you to pray. You pour it out, you shut up, and you let me pray. Right. When I tell you that was an eye opener for me, I was like, I thank God for spiritual sisters like this. Because that was such an eye opener for me. Because I was, I was so used to praying when you know while the other person was praying and they while they praying, pouring back into me, I'm draining myself more while they're praying. She just told me, Well, you shut up. And she said exactly like that. And I learned that. Yes, sir. So what you just said is a great uh, revelation because a lot of times when you do pour out into everybody and then a lot of leaders don't know how to humble themselves and let somebody pour into them, mm -hmm. and not realizing that you just emptied your glass, so you need to refill this, so you have some energy to keep doing what you're doing. Yes. And, and when you don't let person. somebody do that, you cut off a flow. Yeah. Yes, that's good. Ooh, that's good. Right? That was good. Say that one more time for the people in the balcony. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. I caught that. That was mm -hmm. good. 
That's a seminar by itself. Yes, it is. That is a no, seminar. It's a <laughs> Yes. I caught that when you said not just their flow, but the flow. I, I, oh, I pay attention. Yes, I like that. I like that. I'm going to have to use that. Mm -hmm. I'll give you your credit, yeah. but I'm just yeah. saying. Because mm -hmm. that is. Okay. That's the truth. <laughs> Look, I'll get everything spelled correctly. Because okay. that, that's good, for real. So I'm going to cut off the flow. I like that. See, that's going to be on me all day today now. See? See what happens when you engage with people that know what they're talking about? Because that's seriously going to be on me all day. So, trying to move to the next slide here if it'll let me. There we go. And we're going to wrap up here in a few minutes. I have to be able to function again. I cannot be dysfunctional. What does it mean to be dysfunctional? It means to be abnormal. It means to be unhealthy. And not just families, it's not just families that can be dysfunctional. As individuals, we can be dysfunctional. Yes, yes. So I can be unhealthy. I can be um, abnormal. I don't know how to engage with family members or my children because I'm dysfunctional within myself. And so a lot of times we have to ask ourselves, not only what is the problem, but how do I contribute to the problem? What's my contribution to the problem that we're experiencing? If you all are done, I can move on. Mm -hmm. Everybody good? Okay. So, and again, this is just kind of part two, but I'm just going to move through it. So, in order for me to function again, the beginning is my healing process. I have to begin to heal. This is, again, where the self-confrontation stage comes in. And then this is what I tell people, the detour, which is, you know, I have an e-book uh, that I, I wrote called Hacking Your Mental Detour. And I had to look at it this way because in life, we go through life detours, right? Mm -hmm. Detour is really just a deviated route. So it's a, it's a route that's not normal to me, and I'm inconvenienced because I normally go to my office this way. Now they got construction that's going on, and they're telling me to sign to go this way. And then I get down that street, they forgot to put the other side and tell me which direction to go. So now I'm extra upset. And one thing I had to even do with my personal life is realize that my deviated route, my detour, is really not my enemy. It's my friend. Amen, amen. Because it's showing me other ways that's accessible to me. That I'm used to doing it this way, or I'm used mm. to going this way. Now I have other routes I can take. And it may get aggravated in the beginning to learn those different routes. But once I have them patent down, now I've learned by taking this detour, there's a shortcut to my favorite store. I didn't know nothing about this road down here. Mm -hmm. It's all because of the detour that I have. So that's another way of me being positive and encouraging myself by saying, you know what? I have another route. So, here are the five things that um, I want us to, to look at here with the construction zone. One, we have an advanced warning area. Basically, it gives us a warning that there's change coming ahead, that there's work coming. So, this lets us know that you're about to go your normal route, but there's a change coming ahead. Mm -hmm. And isn't it funny, because even the word says warning comes before what? Destruction. So there's nothing we ever walk into unknown. Wow. It's whether I choose to listen. That's right. We, we got that? Yeah. I don't ever walk into nothing unknown. He always lets me know. That's true. It's did I choose to listen or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, 10 times out of 10 is that we chose not to listen, because we knew what was coming. Mm -hmm. Next, we have the transition area. 
It allows us to move through the temporary path. And it's only for a temporary season. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to last. Because remember, they're working on this area. And so as they're working on this area, they're just maybe fixing up the road, adding another uh, road, you know, widening the highway. So that's my transition area. It's not going to last forever. Right. But I have to endure it in this season. Mm -hmm. That's, again, me accepting and respecting the process. Then we have our buffer area. This is the open space in the transitional area and the work zone. This is that in between I was talking about earlier. That while we're in the middle of it, that's where we gain. We learn how to separate and we get revelation. So separation and, and revelation, this buffer zone, this is the uncomfortable place. Because as I'm driving down the construction road, it may get a little bumpy because there's a rock, so there's holes, they're doing things. So even while I'm getting through the transitional zone, this is my buffer area. And now, have you, have you ever hit something like, oh, am I tired? Hey, that was, that was hard. It's just temporary. And then a lot of times when they get done with the highway, you're like, oh, I'm glad they made this bigger. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad they done with it. We're happy because we don't want to go through that, uh, uh, that buffer area. The transitional area and the buffer area, ooh, those are areas we don't want to deal with because it's going to be some bumpy roads. But isn't it wonderful that he'll make every crooked place straight? He'll straighten it out. Then we have our termination area. This is a short distance for traffic to clear the work area. I call this the graduation zone that I'm at the end of it. This is my ending. So I'm done with it. The termination area is I'm outside of the construction area. I don't have to drive five or 10 uh, no more because they're working construction. I'm at the end of the thing. But I cannot get to the termination area and graduate if I don't deal with, as we stated earlier, the transition and the buffer. Those are, all of them are important, but the transition area and the buffer area, that's really where the self-confrontation and evaluation takes place. That's really where I look at things that are bumpy. Why am I, why is it always bumpy in this area of my life? Why is there always some things that's taking me off course? That's where the transition and the buffer area. But remember, if I go through it, I'm going to learn separation and revelation. There's some wisdom I'm going to get that grandma couldn't have gave me. Mm -hmm. My, there isn't there some wisdom we get that we have to get from experience mm -hmm. ourselves. Mm -hmm. I couldn't get it from nobody. I had to go through it. Some people say, where did you get that from? Life. Life. Took me through some turns. Life. So we have to remember that. I hope that I have said something or done something I'm going to give you these worksheets. You can do them if you want on your own time at your leisure. You don't, you don't have to. It's completely up to you. And I normally like to give out handouts, especially, well, especially during the, let me get one more, the evaluation process. Because one thing that we have to know, and I'm, I'm done here, is to make sure that we journal. Yes. Things. Writing it down holds us accountable. Mm. So by me writing it down, it holds me accountable and it allows me to see you're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. It allows me to see where I am and then it allows me to go back to see, look where you came from. Yes. Look how you made it. Celebrate. Celebrate yourself. And I want all of you to think about that. What can I do to celebrate me more? What can I do to celebrate myself more? All right? I thank you all for, for oh, go back to the answer. I can. I, I thank you all for joining me. If you want to find me, you can find me. Um, yeah. <laughs> Look, you're a mover, ain't you? Um, you can find me. Um, everything on social media, Instagram, Twitter, everything is Dr. Redefined. 
B R R E D E F I N E D. It's just my name on Facebook, Jesse Sanders, J E S S E. Last name is Sanders, S A N D E R S. Um, there will be a webinar that we'll actually be doing, a redefining webinar. Um, and Pastor T is going to be involved with it. She didn't know it yet, but I was going to tell her. Um, uh, <laughs> redefining webinar that we're going to be doing because I want more people like us to connect, to walk in our purpose, and then to help other people come out. That I, I love people. When I tell you I love people, and I love celebrating people. I really do. So think of what you can do to celebrate yourself. And, you know, reach out to me anytime. Because I tell you, I love people, and I love to celebrate people and coming out from where we were to where we're going. All right? Give yourselves a hand. Thank you so much, Dr. Jesse. That was amazing. Can we just yes. agree that we're really good? I had a hard time keeping time and staying present and taking notes at the same time. Like, I know I have to do a job, but I'm trying to get this work. I know. So, thank you so much, and I appreciate everybody that came out this morning. Please take some time to complete the evaluation. So, um, uh, I think I found the perfect place. So, okay. uh, it's my picture. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, your uh, other page, the redefining page. Mm -hmm. yeah. Dr. Redefine. Dr. Redefine. Yes, sir. Okay. Everything is Dr. Redefine on social media. Okay. Yes, sir. Evaluation form. Yes, just once you complete the form, you can give it back to me. And I thank you all again. Hey, baby, hold on. Let me uh, do this right quick. Hold on.